right, welcome back to study session five. We're almost near the end, and in this session, we're going to, going to be discussing some assessments. Yay, always fun stuff to talk about. But assessments are very important um, to vocational counseling, your vocational goals, and making sure, we're, hopefully, we're putting the client uh, in the right area according to not only just their functional limitations, but where they can be successful because we do want them to get that good competitive employment but we also want them to be in a place where they're going to succeed and be happy. So here in, um, on this slide we're just going to talk about a couple of intelligence tests and then um, a couple of achievement and aptitude uh, exam. The first intelligent um, test we're going to discuss is the WAS 3 and this was released in 1997 and it's very similar to the R in that it reports in a full scale performance and verbal uh, IQ on the same scale but some items have been modified and changed and there is some re-standardization re with the new norms. There are some changes in the subtest and scores on the three tend to be slightly lower than the scores on the R. But just remember the intelligence tests are, are defined as the ability to solve problems and they look for to learn and retain uh, information. So those are some of the basic components that um, these intelligence tests are looking for. Now this, the R is the most widely used and widely accepted a measure of constructive intelligence in adults is uh, the R. This instrument has a strong construct validity, meaning that it is testing what it's supposed to test. Um, that when asked what intelligence is, many researchers will say it's what it is measured by the R. So basically, they really, really trust uh, this intelligence exam. Now the R reports on the verbal performance and full-scale IQ scores. These IQ scores are ratio IQs, meaning that for each age group, the mean set, the mean is set at 100, and standard deviation 15. Subject are always compared with others in their age group, and IQ scores, excuse me, accordingly reflect relative performance within one's age group. So there is more, probably more error or noise in IQ scores, excuse me, I cannot get that out today, and IQ scores reported from the field, and this extends, like, extends likely to the range of a true IQ for any score observed on testing. So it goes into all what the test is uh, measuring and what percentages and, and measurements you get from each of those. But it's basically just important for you just to know what the three and the R are and what the differences are. You don't have to really go into um, it's measured on a 4.41 scale and you know and things of that nature because then you would have to go into understanding standard deviations and things of that on more than just a basic a knowledge level and that's not what you're really going to see in the CRC exam. They just want you to know the difference between the various intelligence tests, aptitude tests, achievement tests, personality tests, and things of that nature. So going into all that really isn't important but just knowing what they are. And when, you re when you're reading those scenarios on the CRC exam and they reference a type of intelligence test of course, it, it would behoove you to know what they're referring to so that you can understand the scenario and answer the question appropriately. Okay, on the R, IQs are, are classified as follows. So I'll just kind of go through those. 130 plus is very superior, 120 to 129 superior, 110 to 119 is a high average, a 90 to a 109 is average, 88 to 89 is low average, 70 to 79 is borderline, and of course a 69 they have registered as a mentally uh, challenged. There are 11 subtests on the R. 
and each has a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. Now again, just knowing those is important, not necessarily having to try to understand all what it what it's measuring and the different scores and various things like that, but it may just ask you a true false question of does the WAS have 11 subtests? The, what does each have? A t you know, each have a mean of what? A 10 and a standard deviation of 3. Questions like that. So I don't want you to get all concerned and anxious over you having to know, have deep, deep knowledge on statistical terms because some of those, those terms are listed in the manual that I have and in most CRC manuals, but it's just on a basic level of knowing what ordinal and nominal and things of that nature mean and what standard deviation is, what a mean, median, and mode. But those are things that you learn, again, early on in school and then if you've had some basic math courses in college, just on that basic level. You don't have to know anything in depth, like be a <laughs> statistician or anything like that. But it's good to be able to identify the different measures of performance from the intelligence test, just for a basic understanding. Okay, let's move on to the aptitude and achievement test. One big achievement test that I wanted to make note of was the GRE because that's usually the exam that many rehab counselors would take anyway to get into grad school and many other individuals as well. So it's a very familiar exam. GRE stands for Graduate Record Exam and it's designed to predict how much students will learn and how easily they will master material presented to them in a graduate program again. Higher scores should learn more easily and with less effort and for the same effort as invested by lower scores come away with more knowledge and skills. Um, examinations taken in their courses are achievement tests as is the CRC exam. So that's why I made a note of it with a little asterisk beside it just so you know that the exam that you are preparing to take and will take and pass um, is known as an achievement exam. An aptitude test battery that is most widely used, again, by rehab counselors. Um, more likely, not necessarily rehab counselors, but the examiners that are assessing our clients will use this battery. And it's a general aptitude test battery. It's known as the GATB. GATB scores have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. Now this is a question that I actually put on my practice exam asking that because I have known for that question to be on the CRC exam. So that's again just like with the intelligence test we were speaking to that I was speaking to earlier, it's good to know what is their mean of the test, what is the standard deviation because I have seen those in multiple choice uh, format on the CRC exam. So the GATB scores have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. This instrument, also this is a very important thing to know, was developed by the United States Department of Labor and is used by state employment offices and in many rehab sites. Personality test. The MMPI-2. Um, now, let's talk about the difference between personality tests and intelligence and aptitude achievement tests. And personality tests, unlike the intelligence tests and the uh, aptitude and achievement, there are no right or wrong answers because, again, we're talking about your personality. Um, they are generally untimed and what is most important is that you're just honest when you're taking these type of tests. The MMPI-2 is a psychometric instrument with a standardized administration scoring and norms. Um, the thematic uh, app perception tests, they're more like impression, impressionistic measures of personality. The Minnesota, which, was, which is what MMPI stands for, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory 2, is the most widely used personality test for diagnosing psychopathology. This instrument has 
four validity skills and 10 basic clinical skills. Again, it has four basic validity skills and 10 basic clinical skills. The MMPI, let me repeat what it stands for, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory 2. Now, all scores are reported as T scores where the mean is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. Many additional skills have been developed using 567 true false items. It can be hand scored or scored and interpreted by a computer. Again, the basic use of this personality test is to diagnose psychopathology. Now, uh, another um, personality test that a lot of individuals are familiar with, and I just put it on here so that you can connect the two, is the ink block test, also known as the Warshaw uh, test. And that's a personality test. Usually, you see it in a lot of movies where they have a picture and they ask you, what do you see, and things of that nature. So again, they use that a lot to diagnose psychopathology. And there are many other personality tests on the market that other places use just as well, but the MMPI is the most widely used, so I wanted to make sure that we kind of discuss that a little bit. Maybe it would be helpful to talk about the basic clinical skills of M MMPI too. Uh, one is like hypochondriasis, depression, conversion, hysteria, psychopathic deviant, masculinity, femininity, paranoia, things of that nature are all on schizophrenia are all on the basic scales of this type of personality test. Other personality tests as I was speaking to earlier are the 16 personality factors questionnaire, California psychological inventory, the Myers-Briggs which uh, type indicator which I talked about earlier and then this personality assessment inventory. So there are many others out there but the MMPI 2 is the one that's most widely used. Two type of interest inventories that I wanted to talk about were the self-directed search. Um, that's used quite frequently and I do remember most of the time in your assessment course that's usually one of the assessments that's usually talked about or if you're asked to do an assessment assignment as far as taking an assessment a lot of students choose to do the SDS and then there's the wide range interest opinion test now let's go see and if you remember what theory helped develop the self-directed search. John Holland's work, remember we were talking about him earlier and I mentioned some of the uh, interest inventories that were developed as part of his theory and the self-directed search was part of it. Now self-directed search per its name can be self-administered, scored, and interpreted. Both, again, were developed from John Holland's uh, environment and personality model. Um, the six occupational environments that were identified by him are used on these instruments. Social, enterprising, conventional, realistic, investigative, artistic. Holland believed that each work environment reflected a somewhat different orientation toward life and values, interests, preferred activities, and interpersonal relationship style. So individuals working environments were compatible with their personality style were most likely to be satisfied with their work. So there are some other interest inventories um, on the market like the wide range interest opinion test, Cooter, that's used a lot. Uh, my daughter, who is in the sixth grade, uh, has taken versions of the Cooter even now because, again, remember I was saying that in vocational rehab in particular, we would start 
just talking about vocational rehab services and probably the junior or senior year from a transitional standpoint. But now with some uh, new federal guidelines and regulations that are coming forth, we're going to start working with individuals younger than that, around the age of 14. So now the schools are starting even younger with doing some interest inventories as far as career choice and vocational wise with students and and Chloe has come home and told me she's taken some different exams and I was happy to know that I was aware of those type of assessments and what they were looking for and we were able to talk about them. Okay now let's go in speaking of vocational choice and and finding out vocational goals and career choices for our clients. Let's talk about the DOT. DOT stands for Dictionary of Occupational Titles and it was formally published by the U.S. Department of Labor and classified by Unique Digit Code. Stated in a lot of text that is superseded by the Occupational Information Network, the ONET, but we still refer to it as the DOT and many institutions, including vocational rehab and other institutions, still say DOT, don't necessarily say ONET, it's just more likely the system that is used. But we still use those nine digit codes uh, to look up vocations that we think would fit well with our different clients when developing their IEP. So there, to us, of course, we know about the ONET and using the DOT, Occupational Outlook Handbook, and things of that nature, but we still um, refer to it as a DOT and use interchangeably with the ONET as well. Um, it says here in the study guide that I have um, used to develop my study training material that the all net will impact some questions on the CRC exam, but it's not really known how. So that's again why I wanted to kind of go over the Dictionary of Occupational Titles for those of you who haven't quite gotten into the field in depth enough to have been able to um, had a chance to see even some DOT numbers or be able to utilize them in your field work or anything of that nature. So besides just your readings and your coursework, make sure that you do some research with the DOT because if there are going to be more questions than usual about this area, uh, you would need to have some more information on them. But I'm going to go over um, quite a bit of information here in just a second, but again, it's going to be very condensed. So if you need some more in-depth uh, information, use your study material, and you can always just go on the internet and, and find a plethora of information on the DOT. Now, speaking of the digits, let's break them down. Those first three digits of the DOT signify the occupational category. The next three are the division I'm sorry, the next three the first three digits, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. The first three digits of the DOT signify the occupational category. The first digit is the the category, the second uh, digit is the division, and the third group, the third digit is the group. Digits four through six specify the job's relationship to the data. And then the final three digits are just for the computer only, existing to give each job a unique code. So the first six digits are the, are the most important to the counselor, and they can be conveniently remembered as each group falls alphabetically. So again, those last three are just unique numbers so that the computer can identify them and give them a unique code. Those first six are the ones that kind of help uh, the counselor identify different jobs in that area, especially if they're trying to use um, transferable skills. So if you have a person who has some housekeeping background, those first six will help them look for jobs 
and you're utilizing transferable skills in that way, then you would look for jobs like cleaner and janitor. They would all kind of be in those in that category of area. And that way you can use those skills to be able to find them employment, but probably, as I'm going to discuss later, with a lighter physical demand or different conditions. So let's go into that since I've kind of already talked about. So why are those first numbers relevant? Very basically, like I was just saying, those transferable skills, the consumer may have those transferable skills to other jobs in the occupational group. So those numbers will help you, like I said earlier, look for jobs in those areas. Now why are the second three digits relevant? Because remember I said the first six are the most important. They will tell you, the second group will tell you how demanding or how much of a demand um, the, the consumer's past employment has been in relation to working with, with data, people, and things, and how demanding jobs under consideration may be in those areas. So it looks at job demand. So let's look at physical demands as related. When we're looking at vocational goals and in relation to what a client used to be able to do before, depending on what they can do now based upon their present disability and functional limitation. So if they're saying that um, when you're looking at the DOT and you're researching jobs, they're going to give you information on the physical demands. So one would talk about strength when you're looking at the physical demands of one. It would talk about lifting, carrying, and pulling. If you see a two, that's talking about if it involves climbing or balancing. Three would talk about stooping, kneeling, crouching, crawling. If you see five would talk about a, a, a reaching, handing things, and feeling and doing some fine motor movements. And then six would be talking or hearing. It's a lot of a noise around in seven C. So why is that important? Well, physically, if they have uh, some knee injuries, that you need to look. If the job has a lot of stooping or kneeling, they probably won't be able to do that. If they have something with their rotator cuff, then reaching and handling may be an issue. It just depends on the level um, of pain or discomfort that they're having in that area. Now, working conditions are relevant. They may have done a job that was outside previously, but now, again, with their current disability or physical limitation, they cannot do that anymore. So the working conditions talks about being inside or outside or both. Will the job require to be in extreme cold or extreme heat or wet or humid conditions? Exposure to a lot of noise or vibrations that may refer to some psychological um, limitation or disability. A lot of times you will hear individuals in vocational rehab refer to a SVP. That is a shortened form of stating specific vocational preparation, meaning their training basically, or the time um, that they may have had some type of classroom instruction or experience necessary to do a job. If you, you're looking in the DOT or looking at a job, we've already discussed those digits, broke those down, now you see an SVP of one. Well, that's saying short demonstration only. That's usually like an unskilled type of job. They don't need a lot of training or instruction in that area. Two, the same thing. It's anything beyond a short demonstration up and including to 30 days. They might need like a quick little 30-day training. So those are usually your unskilled jobs. Three and four, three is 30 days to three months, four is three to six months. Those are your uh, semi-skilled jobs. Five and six and on up, six months to a year, six is one to two years, seven, two to four years, eight, four to ten years and nine, ten years or more. Those are more of your skilled jobs. You're looking at uh, three and four again are your semi-skilled, but five and up are usually more looking at more of your skilled jobs. That usually means it's probably requires some vocational training or some college. So that also helps you in identifying jobs and 
again that a client had before if they've only done unskilled work and they only have a 12th grade education high school diploma or GED so you might need to stay in a certain area as far as their preparation levels skills again that's what I was talking about uh, the SVP one to two is that unskilled work three to six Again, remember I said the three and four, five and six, that's semi-skilled. And then on up, you're looking at more of your skilled work. Some even see maybe five and six as some skilled work. Depending upon, even though it's registered on a semi, depending upon the type of work that you do and how long you did, they may lean more toward even the skilled area and may look at, may be able to look at maybe a seven, a skill level, even if you previously only done a five or a six depending on your um, experience. These areas, when you're looking at the DOT, and I know it seems like a lot of information, you're thinking, man, I didn't know a vocational rehab counselor had to do all of this when just trying to line out their vocational goal. But it's very important, again, because we, we don't want to set them up for failure. We want to be able to put them in a vocational goal that they're going to be successful in. So it's very useful in doing a job analysis report again particularly with transferable skills if they're kind of just coming into a career you usually probably have to do some type of senator vocational training first or something in that area but if they're coming in having had a, a pretty good long work history and want to kind of stay in that area then all of this information is very good in conducting a job analysis and looking at those transferable skills and seeing what other occupations you can put them in that are related to some past employment. So that was quite a bit uh, in this session five, but again, very important information to know. It can go even deeper than I have when in this PowerPoint. Uh, please feel free to read further and do some extra research on your own, and I'll see you back in, again in Session 6, and it'll be our last session.